Well, here's a neat little machine. This is a JVC multi-system VCR. Uh, is there a model on the front? Yeah, the HR-D337MS multi-system. And uh, yeah, I've, I don't have a multi-system VCR before now. Now this won't convert. This will play PAL, CCAM, MEC CAM, and the two variants of NTC, no problem. But it won't convert. So if it's playing PAL, it's outputting in PAL. But I want to show you something interesting. Let's operate. Come on, that is so cool. It's got a bit of a bug sometimes where it goes crazy. Let's feed it a tape so it shuts up. I haven't really done anything to this yet. Come on. There we go. Now it's working. Turn on. A sensor on this somewhere is, is acting funny. I gotta take it apart and clean it. But once you get a tape in there, it shuts up. Anyway, I'm gonna turn on my TV. So I have it hooked up to my TV and I'm in North America. So this is an NTSC TV. But what's interesting is, uh, let me hit play here. Oh man, that is loud. So first of all, I'm playing an NTSC tape. Let's adjust the tracking here. Clean it up. What's interesting is this is an LP tape. So it just plays like trash on JVC machines. Like look at how sensitive this tracking is. As soon as I clean that up, another bar shows up. And uh, where does it show me? Here we go. It's an NTSC tape playing an LP. So, okay, I'm playing an NTSC tape, playing on there, that's fine. Understandable. Hey, isn't this wacky? Look at this. Recorded in the LP mode. That's how you know this is cheap. So let's grab the one and only uh, PAL tape that I have. And the only reason I bought this, and I should have bought more, they had the whole set for sale, is because of this awesome, very cool uh, case. I don't know what country this is from. I'm not really familiar with those characters, but I know that it is not NTSC, so let's pop it in. Okay. We're gonna hit play. Now, right now it's an auto. So I believe, there we go, it switched over to PAL. But it's playing on my TV. It's actually playing really nice. Like 625 lines versus 525. I noticed the difference. I, I didn't think I would, but I do. So let's hit pause here. Yeah, decent enough pause. So this TV of mine that I already like because it has HDMI, VGA, component, composite, S-video. It has an analog tuner. It has a digital AS ATSC tuner. We'll also accept PAL video signals on the composite input. So this Philips magnet box does freaking everything. But yeah, there we go. So playing an SP recorded PAL tape. And I have it set to auto. If we look at the settings here, get the good focus. So I can also set it to manual. And let's see here. I have it set to PAL. So if I flip it to MEC cam slash C cam, you can see on MEC cam, the color is weird and jumping in and out. C cam, the color is lost, but there's a lot of noise. I believe that's the color information, maybe being decoded as just uh, Luma information. If I flip back to MEC cam, I can go to 
Uh, that's set to NTSC, which of course you won't get anything because the uh, the lines are different, right? You have a different number of horizontal lines. Let's go back to auto. Now we're in color. If we take kind of a look at the front of this VCR, first off, aesthetically, this thing is just wonderful. It's got that late 80s hard lines, lots of hard corners, sharp corners, the nice shiny gold lettering on here. I'm pretty sure this is very similar to a lot of JVC VCRs from this time period, but I am very unfamiliar with them. Have, I was a Panasonic guy. Lots of Panasonic VCRs around here, not a lot of JVCs. So you have stop eject, separate, play. Um, there's a slow, which I believe, I think that's just the speed for slow. The heck they just do? Just shut off there, that's weird. Play again, so what does slow do? Oh, there we go. So now you can speed up slow motion. You have your, uh, let's go back to play. You have your fast forward and rewind scan. Nice and responsive. There's all your indicators on the front here. So your, your um, SP, LP, EP record speeds. Uh, whether it's set to auto or not, what the different formats are. And if you push open, oh yeah, and it is forehead to allow azimuth. Not hi-fi though, which kind of sucks. Though finding a hi-fi multi-system VCR in North America is pretty difficult. You have a sharpness control, uh, your tape memory, so counter just resets at zero, or this actually does support index. So you can record indexes on the tape and then fast forward and rewind to them. Automatic find control for the tuner. Now tape speed, this being a JVC, it only supports two speeds, but it's LP for everything except NTSC. So all the 625 lines, uh, the LP was pretty typical. I think there is EP for PAL formats, but it's very uncommon. And it's due to tape speed. Uh, I'm gonna put up a little chart of tape speeds to kinda give an idea and here's the VHS tape speeds and if you take a look LP is LP PAL is in between LP and EP for NTSC so you're getting a lot of information on the tape already you're getting a ton of information because you're doing 50 frames per second instead of 60 or I guess 50 fields per second instead of 60 you're fitting a lot more on the tape because the swipes of the head drum are, are uh, there's less of them. So the long and short of it is on PAL, you can fit a lot more on the same amount of tape. There's all your digital tracking, channel set, clock adjust, program set, all your uh, programming stuff for setting the clock and setting it to record a show. And again, duplicate these LEDs just shine through this front door so you can still see them with the door down. And you have your direct controls on the front. So if I hit stop, so I can just punch in whatever channel I want. 34, what? Oh, it only goes up to 32, okay. 23 then. Now this is a PAL tuner. Uh, the RF modulator on the back is PAL only. So the only way you can get um, an NTSC signal that you can easily hook up to an NTSC TV out of this is with the composite. I think if you were to... Actually, I should try this. I think if you were getting a, to get an adapter for the connector on the back so you could hook it up to a North American TV and then you tuned in to the UHF channels that this supports on the back, on an NTSC TV and played an NTSC tape, it might work. I'm gonna try that. So here's the back of the machine. And in typical PAL format fashion, you have BNC connectors for your video out. 
So you have a little BNC to RCA adapter on there. You have a switch for color in black and white, which was pretty common on PAL machines. I don't know the exact reason why. I don't know if it's to do with a lack of color killer on some older sets or what, but yeah, you could switch it to black and white in case the color was giving you problems. Audio in and out, some mono VCR. And here are those uh, European antenna connectors that are kind of like an RCA connector, but not. Uh, you can turn on attenuation, which is kind of neat. Not really sure why. And in typical style of um, European VCRs, if you see a North American VCR, it's just channel three and four, right? It's, it's super simple. But like, let's take the UK, for example. VHF was reserved for the old 405 line standard. So when they went to 625 line, they did what the US originally planned to do, which was go to UHF. So before they came up with compatible color in the US, the plan was to take the new newly allocated UHF channel band and say, this is gonna be for color and VHF, the old channels two to 13 or whatever were for black and white. That's what they did, at least in the UK. So this outputs on UHF because you only had UHF. If you look at European TVs compared to the North American counterparts, North American had the two dials, VHF, UHF. The European ones just had a little plug where the VHF would go, or they'd put the volume control where VHF normally would be. And you just had a UHF dial. I think it was channels like 20 to 69 or 20 to 83. You started around 20. Anyway, the long-winded ramble there was because this is your adjustment for picking a channel. And your channel range is a lot larger than three to four. So you take a little screwdriver and you adjust this variable cap, I guess, inside there. And you can turn on a test signal. So rather than having to have a tape playing, this will output a test signal. I haven't tried this yet. And I don't know what this is. One moment. All right, Wikipedia to the rescue. So standard K um, is most of Central and Eastern Europe. I is the UK, Ireland, Hong Kong, South Africa, and Macau. What was the other one? It wasn't D, I think it was G. Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and then M is Brazil. In Brazil, PAL is used in conjunction with the 525 line system M. The difference concerns the audio carrier frequency and channel bandwidths. Okay. Neat. So I was kind of wondering, well, different channels have different channel number assignments for frequencies. They're not all the same in PAL countries. But what this does is this just gives you a wide range where you tune in, like sort of the older North American sets. So these channels are presets. And you go and you set your preset on here. You do channel search, set up and down. So you check your set the switch on the back of your tuner to the correct standard for your country, then manually tune in your channels. Now I'm not going to bother with this because of course I do not have any analog PAL channels, but I want to try and see if this will output an NTSC tape to an NTSC TV. There's the test signal. I don't know if it's supposed to be in color or not, but it's in black and white because NTSC TV, it's just two vertical lines, vertical bars. This is tuning in somewhere in the like high 20s. And I know that channel selector was between 32 and 40. So clearly not the same channel numbering, but like whatever, you, it's there. Let's uh, try playing an NTSC tape now. Well, interesting. This is that LP tape, and I got some color here. This tracking issue I'm suspecting is probably just a guide misalignment on here. It shouldn't actually be this bad. Let's get that cleaned up a little bit. Look at that though. Come on. Ooh, that's even worse. It's about as good as she gets. There's color. Interesting, interesting. Of course, if I flip the switch over to another standard, that's a product of VHS flipping its shit. Um, yeah. 
But cool, okay, so I get color on an NTSC tape. So let's put in a PAL tape now. <laughs> nice. Let's get the vertical hold adjusted a little bit. So you gotta slow down the vertical. There we go. And uh, screen is of course flashing slower because I've slowed the vertical down. So you get that little shimmer sometimes when it tries to fight the 60 hertz lights I have in this room as my camera tries to figure it out. But yeah, no problem at all, just no color. If we go back to NTSC here, let me bring the vertical back up to speed. There we go, we got color. Oh, you know what, I had the tuning off. That's why the color was so, so wacky. I mean, it doesn't look great. but it is outputting NTSC in color. Here's my janky setup for sending my signal to my TV without any proper adapters. Absolutely lovely. So here I have it hooked up to another flat screen. However, this one does not support PAL. So this Toshiba, it's from about 2008 I would say, doesn't support a PAL input like that similar vintage uh, Philips Magnet box, I'm, magnet box I'm using. One other thing I want to mention about this before let's, we look inside that I find a little interesting is I got lucky and this is a multi-voltage. So this is new enough to have a switching power supply that will auto detect your input voltage. So no worries about setting a switch, setting it wrong, killing something. That's nice. But the plug, the molded plug, is North American. It's kind of a weird North American plug, you know? It just looks slightly different than the ones I'm used to seeing from this era. But it's North American. It doesn't really look like it was changed over either. Get some light here. This looks kind of factory to me. Maybe not. But why does this have a North American plug? which would imply that it was sold in North America, but have a European tuner. That seems weird to me. I don't know the answer. All right, here's the part I'm sure some of you have been screaming for. Let's look inside. This being an older model, there's a lot more to it. Here's the switching power supply. Yep. That looks like a switching power supply, all right. There's board. I think there's actually a board underneath that runs across the whole thing. Now, I believe if I want to look inside, I should just take these two screws off. And I think it's those two, and the whole thing just flips up. Let's see. Hmm, never mind. More screws than I thought. There's a screw on the back. There's three screws on the circuit board, and then two along the back here and then this thing just lifts up and I have it propped up but I believe if you bear with me this has little holes that sit on these posts so this board will just sit there that's nice I think the wiring is a little tight on it but it does the job all right let's take this corroded cover off so we can see the mechanism small complaint those screws that hold this down and hold this board down use a very small Phillips uh, bit, like tiny, which is annoying because this is not a magnetized screwdriver. My magnetized screwdrivers are the larger style ones. So yeah, minor complaint. Taking a look inside here, it looks just like every other VCR. I'm sure those who know these mechanisms will be looking at this going, ah, oh, yes, this is a such and such. Let's get this tape out of here. I'm thinking this has a mode switch issue because it loses its mind. Getting a tape in here is a chore. It's a predictable chore. It's predictable what it does, but what it does is wrong. So it could be a switch contact that's dirty in here. Mode switch, I don't know. Like I said, I haven't done anything to this yet. Just jumped in. It does have an idler tire here. Feels pretty good. Uh, I can see one little crack there. Camera probably won't pick it up like that, but seems to perform fine, so I'm gonna leave it. 
brakes all look good. Uh, grease is pretty nasty. and definitely regrease that. Loading motor. I'm assuming everything else is on the bottom. So let's see what happens when I try and put a tape in and it loses its mind. Wake up. Seriously, now it works? It's doing this because I'm recording. There we go. Now, if I turn it back on, there we go. That really feels mode switchy. And what you have to do, you have to power it off, let it time out, put the tape in here, and then power it on. It's an art form. Yeah, here's your tuner board. Goes over to this guy here. This is a board that I don't know. Got a lot of these little, you know, uh, circuit boards, little separate modular boards. It's that. It's definitely a product of that sort of late 80s where things were still complicated. They hadn't yet, had not yet simplified like the mid-90s where it's just one main circuit board and just a chassis stuck on top. Not as complicated as that past Sonic I looked at earlier, but, you know, still a fair bit. Still lots of wire bundles, little harness bundles going everywhere. Yeah, let's take a look at the bottom of this. Damn, there's lots of motors in this. You got a motor for the idler, motor for the capstan, it's all a sealed unit. Motor, obviously for the drum, which is pretty common. Here's another motor. So there's a motor on top, I'm assuming, for the front load. I'm guessing this motor is to load the guides into place, to actually load the tape. There's the encoder switch. That's going to be a bitch to get to. I'm going to have to pull the chassis out from the top. Maybe I can just squirt some contact cleaner in there and run it through its paces. Huh. Anyway, there's the bottom. Not as exciting as I thought it would be. Here you can see the back side of that other board underneath there. It does not go all the way across like I thought it might. There's more circuit boards that are all along the bottom. These are not as visible as I thought they'd be. A lot of plastic on this chassis. Like this, this whole frame piece here. Lots of plastic. Okay, now I'm questioning myself. This is clearly just interference from the light above, right? But then why was it doing it when I had the cover on? All right, so I've decided to take the uh, loading mechanism out. Little annoyance, uh, this is all hardwired in. So you have to kind of twist it to the side and just leave it hanging. These connectors, some are removable, but if all of them aren't removable, then I have to undress all of these and find out where to disconnect them elsewhere on the VCR. So, stupid. Anyway, the way this works, I had to overflow off my workbench, is uh, there's this gear here, and I have it, let's pull this tray back, to the unloaded state. There, see that little hole right here? That goes through an optical switch, basically. Here we go. So this transmits and receives, uh, I'm guessing, an infrared signal. And then that hole on the gear is used to detect when the tape is in the fully ejected position. This other little IR LED here is the uh, end of tape sensor. So I actually should check to see if the end of tape sensors are working because this might be related. 
Uh, I cleaned this out, so I'm hoping it was just a piece of dirt in there, because if not, either this part has failed or the voltage supply that's supplying this and possibly this one is failed. But that makes sense because the way this is acting is it constantly thinks the tape is pushed in. So it's constantly trying to eject or load and it's getting confused. Once you're able to get it to load and you put a tape there, great, it goes in. But it's constantly thinking that the tape cartridge is anywhere but unloaded. So here or all the way in and depending on what else it sees, depends on how it affects how it reacts. So it still works, but without this, it's very annoying. I'm going to get a tape I don't care about and try and rewind it and see if the end of tape sensor is working. Looks like the end of tape sensor is working. Uh, I didn't fast forward all the way to the end, but uh, in rewinding, it's the LED on this side that would matter and it seems to be working fine. It does, however, seem to absolutely lose its mind. And I had all the lights off and it was still losing its mind. So it's not an overhead light thing. See, it thinks it's reaching the end of the tape. Let me shut the lights off. All right, we're in the dark now. This is night mode. Let me hit fast forward. I'll hit rewind. It's very hard to see on the camera, but it actually does stop properly. Get some light in here. If it didn't stop properly, hey, come on, there we go. If it didn't stop properly, you'd hear it kind of go and pull on the tape and then time out after a few seconds but it stops as soon as it sees this. So the issue is most likely that infrared sender slash receiver unit there that's bad. Uh, one thing I did notice that I didn't notice before, watch what happens when I eject. This thing always thinks there's a tape inside, which makes perfect sense if that sensor is not working correctly. Now what I might do is I might take this mechanism out and sort of sit it out here and power it on and see if I'm getting voltage. But yeah, I suspect that's the problem. I might go and look for a replacement part. The problem is being in CAD, I know it's going to end up being more than this thing is worth. And the fact that it kind of works well enough even without it, ah... Uh, you know, I know it's foibles. I, I know I know how to make it do what I want it to do. And that's power it on with the tape half loaded inside. I, what more do you want from it? It's not causing any other problems. Just leave it, leave it alone, okay? Leave it alone. It's trying its best. It's old. It's tired. It... Anyway, I think that's about it. Uh, sorry for anyone who wanted me to fully fix this VCR. I mean... I kind of feel like I've narrowed down the issue and if I really wanted to, I could get it working. If I do plan to sell this, like I plan to keep this. If I do plan to sell it, I might try and repair it. Or if I run into a parts JBC VCR that I can pull one of these components off of, absolutely. But for the cost that I'm assuming it'll be for one of these replacements, I, yeah, I don't know. Stop it, you're not at the end of the tape. Watch, it rewinds a bunch. Let's let it rewind a ton.
Now it works. Look at that. Getting some weird flickering on here. I think the onboard controller is acting up. Look at that. There we go. So now it's at 8,000. Let's go back to seven. It is very insistent that always rewind, always going backwards. So anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I guess it potentially could be that switch, but the fact that other things are acting up and it's acting up in a way that it sees or it thinks it sees the IR signal, right? Because the way the end of tape sensor works is when the clear leader goes through, it sees the sent the signal there. So what it keeps thinking is that it's seeing the signal on the sensor on the right hand side over here or left hand side over here. I didn't look at that one, but it thinks it's seeing something there. So it's not like the infrared emitter is not getting power. It's quite the opposite. The input from the little sensors in, in the middle is tripping. It's false tripping. So we got two issues. One is that the end of tape center, end of tape sensor is falsely tripping and going off. And one that it's not seeing the position signal for the tape being fully ejected. Now I suspect they both probably go to the same controller I see. So the question becomes, is it a bad IC? Um, is it a bad voltage going to it that's causing it to act funny, like a power supply issue? Is it capacitors? Because, uh, you know, capacitors, I don't know. This is very weird. The rewind end of tape, the rewind end of tape sensor seems to work just fine. Like if we let it go all the way back to the beginning here, it should go all the way back to the very beginning. Like perfect. And that's with memory off. Yeah, memory is off. Yeah, okay. Fast forward now. <laughs> The only way forward is to play. All right, I, I can't just leave this problem alone here. So let's let's adjust these guys. So at least at least we can feel like we accomplished something. Okay, and at the top here. That seems a little better like that. Let's go back to the bottom. Okay, that looks decent. Now let's try that LP tape. Okay, uh, that's a happy ending. Now the tracking problem's gone. Yay! This tape still looks like shit though. <laughs> yeah, JVCs the the on NTSC LP they just blank out. They they don't even bother trying to display what's going on here. Look at that completely blanks out and fast forward scan. But yeah, this tape looks like crap on other VCRs too. Anyway, at least we fixed that. I'm gonna keep poking around here out of boredom. 
Might take a look at this power supply. You can tell it's had a lot of use, a lot of heat.